Welcome to the Candidates Forum here on Orca Media. It's presented also by The Bridge to help voters know their candidates better. I'm Linda Radke, this evening's moderator. And these forums are intended to provide candidates with the opportunity to share their views and explain why they think they should be elected. It's not a debate, so they will not question each other. These forums are unique in that we've invited all candidates who are in the November 8th ballot, not just those from major parties. Before introducing the three candidates we have with us, I'll go over the format. We ask the public for questions in advance, and we use them to help us develop a list of questions for the candidates. During this program, we also call, use call-in questions. A volunteer will write down the questions and pass them on to me, the moderator. We'll fit, fit as many questions as we can. Questions were not given to the candidates in advance. First, every candidate will have two minutes to introduce themselves, explain why they're running, and to make opening remarks. After that, the candidates will have one minute and a half to answer each question, and at the end, one minute for closing statements. Let's start first with Gina Galfetti from Barrytown. Good evening, and I'd like to thank uh, The Bridge and Orca Media for having me on tonight. It's a great chance to see what everybody has to say and their thoughts. Um, I'm running because when I moved back to Vermont after a 15-year absence, I saw a place that had greatly changed, and not necessarily for the better. I realized that as a Vermonter who was born and raised in Barrie, it was my duty to run for public office. The high cost of living, the lack of trade and vocational training, and the push of the green agenda, no matter what the cost, are all issues that I feel strongly about. I'm an average Vermonter who owns and works a small blue collar painting business. And I feel Vermont needs more people like me in the legislature because I experience the issues that average income Vermonters experience. I think it is very important to have folks in the legislature who are not people that aspire to be career politicians. I want to see more balance in Montpelier and provide Phil Scott with an offensive and defensive line. As it stands, Mr. Scott is like a quarterback without either. With the supermajority in Montpelier pushing an agenda that is not right for Vermont, we need to push back against policies that are harmful to Vermonters and as a, <laughs> as a representative of Barrytown, I want to protect Barrytown from the Chinding County agenda. Thank you. Gina Golfetti, running for representative. And now from the Republican Party, Topper McFawn. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the bridge and Walker for uh, having this forum today. I think it's a great way for people to get to know the candidates. A little about me. After I finished college in Massachusetts and got out of the service, I married a girl from Vermont. We decided to raise our children, not in the city, but in Vermont. So shortly after that, we moved uh, to Vermont, and uh, we live on Sunset Road, and we've lived in that house for 54 years. I've spent my working life in Vermont with my wife, Mary Ann, and three children who grew up here, went to school here, went to college here, and now they live in Vermont with their families. My career has been public service, starting with building the first neighborhood youth corps employment program in the country. I moved on from there to direct the State Office of Economic Opportunity. From there, I went to uh, the State Office of Manpower Services as the Assistant Director. And then I went on to manage the Barry and White River offices of the Department of Labor. After I retired, uh, I was elected to the legislature. I currently serve as the ranking member on the Human Services Committee. I've served as a volunteer on many Barrytown community boards. Currently, I'm on the Central Vermont Home Health and Hospice Board and the Central Vermont Economic Development Board. In the past 12 years in the town, I've served on the Budget Committee, the Board of Civil Authority, the Select Board, 
for 12 years, 10 years as chair, on three terms on the, on the, on the uh, school board. As an aside, uh, if you look at Barrytown Elementary School, there's a big recreation area beside that. Uh, when I was working with the Department of Labor, I, I ran a training program for the Operating Engineers Union, and we leveled that whole ground. That's how that recreation area is there. Another thing that people will remember is when I was on the select board, when I was chair, uh, there was a dump being planned for the Vermont, uh, I mean for Barrytown, on Quarry Hill. And uh, I worked with the select board. I led that fight to defeat that, that uh, dump. So uh, you can see I've served many years uh, in Barrytown. I've served the people as well as I could, and as, in many ways as I could. And I'll continue to do that as long as I'm... I feel that I'm uh, effective and it's going to be fun. Thank you. Tapper McFawn, Ron Barry. Next, Melissa Bata. Hi there. Thank you so much, Linda, and thank you, Orca Media and um, The Bridge, for hosting this forum tonight. Uh, my name is Melissa Bata. I'm running to be your next state representative in the Washington Orange District. Um, my family and I moved to the area eight years ago. Um, we were looking for a house to buy for our kids, to be able to put down roots, to raise our family. And um, uh, we found Barrytown after searching several areas in the surrounding area and said that that was a place that we felt we could call home. And it's been amazing. We have a great community off of the Silver Circle, Cherrywood area, with lots of kids for our kids to play with, great school system. Um, as someone who... Um, has worked in the nonprofit industry for the last two, two decades. Um, I feel that I can bring my experience um, with uh, nonprofit management to the State House in a way that hasn't necessarily been there in the past. Um, you know, as a nonprofit uh, manager, I have to take uh, very tiny budgets or, or very uh, tiny resources and make sure that those resources stretch to meet the budget to provide good quality services. Um, as a homeowner in Barrytown, uh, we see um, the cost of uh, owning a home, the cost of uh, uh, maintaining a home just going up and up. And I want to make sure that we can um, uh, make housing affordable, uh, especially when I look at having housing for young Vermonters, my own children in the future, hopefully. Uh, we want to be able to make sure that they can afford to live um, in Barrytown. Um, and as a mother, I really want to make sure that we continue to have good quality education, uh, safe neighborhoods, and a place for my kids to call a future. Um, I've served on the board of the Good Samaritan Haven for the last six years. The past two years have been as chair of that board. I've served um, also as a reparative board coordinator for the Greater Barrie Justice Center, and I've volunteered in many areas, uh, including with the, the youth soccer program and at my local church. And I'm just really looking forward to this evening to share a little bit more about um, why else I'm running. Thank you, Melissa Bata. I'm Linda Radke with the Candidates Forum, and now we start our questions. Every candidate has a minute and a half to respond, and we're going to switch up the order. So we'll start with Topper first. When you are in the State House, how are you going to use your role to improve things in your district? And what do you think is the most important? issue in your district right now? Well, I think the most important issue that I've heard as I've been around campaigning is the cost of living. And uh, I, I feel that there's not a heck of a lot that we can do on the state level about the cost of living, but we can do some things. Um, like, for instance, the gas tax. We can put a moratorium on that. That would be something that would help people. Something else that would help people is not taxing Social Security. We can do that in the legislature. As a matter of fact, I introduced a bill to do that. I didn't get as much as I want, wanted, but at least it, we've started on the path to reduce uh, taxing Social Security. We should re reduce it completely. 
So there's a couple of things that uh, I think are important. Uh, housing is going to be important. Um, rebuilding the daycare, uh, the child care system will be very important uh, because without that, people aren't going to be able to go back to work. So I think I'll leave it at that, uh, health care. I could go on and on about things that are going to be important, but uh, I don't know if we're going to be able to solve them all. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Melissa Vata. Yeah, you know, Topper, I, I agree with you. At, at the state level, there's really not a lot that we can do about the rising costs. Um, this is a global phenomenon, right? Like, this is happening all around the globe. And there's a couple of different reasons why. You know, number one, uh, there are a lot of corporate pro um, corporations that are profiting at exponential rates. Um, you know, the Albertsons uh, Foundation that owns Shaw's, They've had a 671% profit margin this last year at our expense, right? Like I go to the grocery store and, and the cost is really high. Um, but when I look at what we can do, you know, some of the things that we have done this last year um, in the state legislature and I continue to um, advocate for are things like a Vermont child tax credit. That has really helped a lot of families in our area. Um, you know, making sure that we have grant programs for the, the types of uh, skilled workers that we need, such as childcare workers and trade sc um, scholarships, those are really important. And so I see investing in um, the lives of everyday Vermonters is the best way to help with the rising costs that we see all across the globe. Thank you. And the same question to Gina Galetti. Yeah. <laughs> Galfetti. But Galfetti, that's better, right? this is, sorry, my apologies. <laughs> um, I think that the number one issue that I'm hearing about when I'm out going door to door is affordability for sure. And something that people are particularly concerned about is the rising cost of fuel in the state of Vermont. Um, folks are worried. The cost of fuel has uh, nearly doubled since last year and as they're getting ready to fill their tanks for the winter, they're wondering what they're going to be able to do to afford that. Um, something that we can do at the state level is be aware of the types of legislation that we're passing. The clean heat standard was defeated last session. It was part of the Global Climate Solutions Act. And if it hadn't been for one brave Democrat that was willing to vote, Vermonters would have a tax on home heating oil right now. That carbon tax would increase the cost of fuel universally. Um, as your next state legislator, I will work hard to make sure carbon taxes continue to be examined critically. Um, the conversation surrounding green technologies, such as heat, from, heat, pump, heat pumps and solar, has a lot of upfront costs. Um, this penalizes lower income and middle income Vermonters that can't necessarily afford to convert to these expensive technologies. Um, we need to remember that a majority of homes are still heated um, with fossil fuel. And given that situation, we need to make sure that we're investing in technology that streamlines those types of heating solutions so that we can, you know, continue to make home heating oil and other fuels affordable, quote unquote. For Vermonters, I think uh, one way that would be good to strike a balance is to look at uh, using forest products such as wood for heating. Um, albeit wood has a negligible um, reduction in the amount of carbon output because it uses, um, because if we manage forests reasonably, we'll be able to take advantage of trees before they die. Because once trees have actually died, they start rotting away and producing an excessive amount of carbon. Whereas if we're more managing the forest and using it for things like home heating, um, we could capitalize on uh, reducing the, the carbon output that we have for home heating costs. It would be almost carbon neutral. So that's, uh, that's what I'm really hearing about from folks. Thank you so much. Jeannie Galfetti here for the Washington Orange District. I'm Linda Radke with our moderator forum. And another question coming up is about elections. 
much in the news these days. Do you believe the Vermont legislature needs to focus more attention on election security? And if so, what actions do you propose? Do you believe that, uh, do you believe that 2020 ele presidential election was stolen? So we'll start here with Melissa. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll start with the second part of your question first. I do not believe that the 20, uh, 20 election was stolen. Um, you know, we have had uh, uh, over 100 some odd years, 150 years plus of elections in our country, and we have had the same system, and the system has served us well. Um, as far as here in Vermont, you know, we have one of the lowest, I think this last election cycle there was maybe one um, ballot, if I remember correctly, that was um, questionable. <laughs> and, um, and I think that it's because the Secretary of State's office over the decades has really uh, allowed and ensured that we have safe and secure elections. Um, and we have a system in place that has really enabled that to, to just be fostered. Um, I don't really see um, much of a need to change that at this point. Um, and um, I think that, that having open communications with the Secretary of, Se Secretary of State's office does allow us to um, just monitor that and keep, and keep up to date. But for right now, I don't really see a need to change anything. Thank you. We'll go to Gina Galfetti. Yeah, I believe, as Melissa said, that President Biden was indeed legitimately elected. Um, while there might have been some isolated incidents of voter fraud across the nation, um, I believe, as Melissa stated, that there was only one incident of um, a, having a questionable ballot in the state of Vermont. So that's an extremely good tra track record. Um, in fact, you know, one of the things that we think about when we think about voter fraud was the GOP's demand for an audit. But in states like Arizona, that uh, audit actually proved that Biden had won by a greater margin uh, than originally first thought. The integrity of Vermont elections is something that the rest of the nation could learn from. I think that Vermont elections are generally well run and albeit legislators and candidates should always be open to new ideas. I'm certainly not an expert in election policies, so I would examine election reform policies, listen to various viewpoints coming out of election policy experts, and listen to my constituents and decide based on what I find out. Thank you. The election question to Tupper McFaun. Uh, thank you. Um, as far as President Biden being elected, uh, I believe, yes, that he was elected fairly. Um, as these two women have said, there, there probably was some irregularities, but not to the extent that it was going to change the election at all. Um, we know that approximately 60 cases were brought to court, and uh, from those 60 cases, there, there wasn't enough evidence presented there. Uh, to show that the election should be reversed. So um, I, I think that was fine. As far as changing the way things go in Vermont, um, I, I know that uh, all the ballots have been mail mailed out from the Secretary of State. I know that um, there's about 200 uh, ballots that are in the, the clerk's office that were undeliverable. Um, those uh, the people in the office are working to get that straightened out to see if they can find good addresses for those people, and uh, I'm pretty sure they'll, they'll figure something out. Now, the one thing that I think needs to be done is the checklist. The voter checklist has to be updated frequently because I think that's what the problem is in terms of uh, the, those uh, undeliverable ballots. So Thank that's you. the big thing that I think needs to be changed. Thank you. We're going to move on to the next, next question su submitted by the community. But take a break. Take a little water if you'd like. It's going to be about housing. Certainly very top of mind for our Vermont people. 
Do you think the Vermont legislature should do more to afford affordable housing as well as housing for the missing middle, the moderate income Vermonters? Uh, and if so, what should be done? And we'll start with Melissa Bata. Oh, again. All right. Um, so I want to first tell a story about my housing situation. When, um, when my husband and I first married, uh, we, he was not uh, yet a citizen of the country, so we were living off of my income. And when we found out that we were going to be pregnant, we knew that we had to really look at the housing situation that we had. So we ended up applying for housing and, and were able to live in an apartment in Montpelier through Down Street. Now, over the course of us living there, over a couple of years, we took the homeowners um, course and we were able to qualify for a federal loan to buy our first house together. Um, we had a lot of support and we had some great programs both from the state and federal uh, government. We were fortunate enough, though, to buy our housing before this housing crisis has really ballooned. And I think that at this point, if we were to try to do that all over again now, there aren't enough supports there. And we would be defined as your typical middle income Vermonter, right? And so, um, no, I don't think that we have done enough um, in, over the last decades for housing. Um, and that's why we're seeing ourselves in this housing crisis. Uh, now, in terms of uh, measures that we can take. I know that I've worked on a couple of measures such as um, getting just cause eviction. Um, right now, folks can be evicted with no reason whatsoever. Um, and I know I've heard of folks, right? Um, I also think that we need to do something about, um, about uh, rental registries as well. You know, when you come to an area, we hear Governor Scott all the time wanting to you know, say, hey, we need more folks who are working folks to come to Vermont because we have an aging population and we need a larger tax base. Um, it's very hard as someone coming from out of the state to find rental housing sometimes. There's not really a central location. So doing something like that would help ensure that we have quality uh, units on the market and um, that they can be affordable as well. Thank you very much. Next on the housing question, Tapper McFawn. Thank you. Um, it's clear that we have a housing crisis uh, in Vermont. Um, the legislature has allocated a ton of money to this problem. Before we do anything, what we need to look at is how that money was spent. And we have to evaluate that and make a decision in terms of whether we were on the right track or do we need to do something different. That's number one. Um, number two, if we're on the right track, then I would suggest we do more of that. One of the things that we need to do is not give all that money when we send it out the door to just nonprofit organizations. We need to involve the developers in a bigger way um, a lot of those developers have projects that are ready to go, and um, if they're involved in the planning, then they can tell you what we need to do to get to the, to the point where we're producing a lot of housing units. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Uh, I, know that, I know already that the cost of some of the housing uh, units that we've developed with that money is very high. And uh, it's, it's, it's not, we don't have that kind of money in Vermont. We have about 630,000 people. Half the people don't pay taxes, so we don't have the money. Unless the federal government dumps it here, we have no way to, to get that money so that we can build a whole bunch of uh, units. So, Thank you. But we have to do something in the legislature every year about it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Gina Galfetti, um, housing. This is an issue that's very close to me. I live in a multi-generational household. And the reason that I am doing that right now is I need to save money to afford um, to buy a home. And I'm fortunate that I'm able to do that. Uh, as it stands, we've got a lot of agency overlap in the permitting process. And the permitting process has become very expensive. As a result, um, builders aren't building lower cost homes after they've made the investment in the per permitting process. 
And as Topper said, we need to bring in private builders to meet with us and understand the hurdles that they're facing to building more affordable homes. You know, again, as Topper mentioned, a lot of money has gone to nonprofits, to building house and supporting down payment assistance, which is great. But we need to carefully monitor these projects so we can determine if the money is being spent efficiently to see the greatest returns in housing. I also think that Act 250 could be overhauled to promote downtown development and to reduce the restrictions on large projects. You know, we want to continue protecting Vermont's amazing beauty, but we also need to have uh, development that's going to um, move forward uh, in creating more affordable housing. Thank you very much. Our next question was submitted by the community about at Article 22. So we'd like to know from our candidates, where do you stand on Article 22? that uh, finalizes a four-year process of amending the state constitution to guaranteed reproductive autonomy to pregnant women. And for this one, let's start with Topper. Um, let me start first by saying that I believe in a woman's right to choose. Um, the legislature over the past uh, couple of years has spent a tremendous amount of time on this particular issue. Um, what they came up with is uh, Article 22, which will amend the Constitution. Um, if you read that, um, the personal autonomy piece of it um, is not well defined, and um, it's ambiguous, and I think it is going to cause problems uh, right off the bat. And uh, even the people who drafted it and who sponsored it felt that um, that was the case. Uh, I, uh, in the beginning, I tried to get that changed, was to no avail, so that it was people could understand it. Um, now I think you're going to have a lot of court cases, and uh, that's not going to bode well. Uh, in terms of what they really wanted to do with that amendment. Um, so I have a record of voting on that uh, in the committee. I voted against it the way it's written, and because of that reason, the way it's written, it's ambiguous. And I voted against it on the floor. Thank you very much. Next, Gina Galfetti. First off, I'd like to lead out with uh, I, too, support a woman's right to choose. Um, however, as Topper mentioned, the constitutional amendment that's being put forth is needlessly vague. Article 22 was poorly written, and even its authors um, at the time couldn't define it clearly, and basically stated that they would pass it back down to the courts to make a clear decision on what reproductive autonomy means. I think that as a result of that, um, men could potentially have increased reproductive rights, and that would be to the detriment of women. Um, for example, what would happen if a man brought a suit in a conservative court and a stay of an abortion was issued? You know, things like that are frightening. And we also have to be concerned with the fact that medical providers uh, may face lawsuits as well, given that reproductive autonomy could be ruled on to state that medical abortions or abortions that are not medically necessarily necessary um, could happen after 23, 23 weeks. Right now, um, the current policy of the UVM Health Network is to not perform abortions unless they're medically necessary after 23 weeks. And I think these issues would um, call anybody into question on a Article 22. Um, but I'm going to ultimately, uh, it's ultimately going to be left up to the people. And I'll support whatever the people decide on this issue. Thank you. Mrs. Bata. Can I have a question again, please? Sure. The effects of, I'm oh, sorry, where do you stand at Article 22, which finalizes a four-year process 
of amending the state constitution to guarantee reproductive autonomy to pregnant women. Yes, so um, I, I stand in full support of um, Proposal 5, Article 22. Um, I feel that as a woman, um, no one should have any say, least of all elected officials, over my medical decisions. Um, and I feel that in light of what has happened at a federal level uh, with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, that um, we are in danger of having, as many other states have done, um, having legislators uh, make decisions about my medical decisions and my daughter's medical decisions and my son's future um, partner's medical decisions. Um, and what that does is, like, there are, there's no other <laughs> segment of population where we say um, and make medical decisions for just a particular segment. Um, when it comes to this certain proposal, um, the ambiguity that um, Topper and Gina have referred to is actually put in there to help uh, give the strongest legal uh, defense should anybody try to come after um, our constitutional right. Uh, the whole um, the strict scrutiny is actually a well-known standard in U.S. constitutional law, and it's really hard for, for, to overcome that in a court of law. So I actually feel like this enshrines um, my rights and the rights of every um, uh, Vermonter in, um, in making sure that we are protected and being able to make our own choices. Thank you very much. Thank you. Madam Moderator, yes. could I ask a question? Sure. Um, uh, we're not supposed to be debating each right. other. Right. No. And what just happened is my name and Gina's name were mentioned, and a statement was made that it's not so. Sorry. Well, let's, let's I apologize so, on that. So yeah. I, I think that, that. Would you like 30 seconds? Uh, yeah. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. I'll take 30 seconds. Um, there's a bill uh, that was in my committee um, that. Uh, it gives the least restrictive abortion rights to women in Vermont. And uh, now, we didn't need the constitutional amendment. And if you're going to do a constitutional amendment, you better do it right. Um, that particular bill, uh, I voted for. And I stood up on the floor and gave a, a speech about it. And I also introduced contraceptive uh, legislation on the heels of that bill, and with my committee, we got it passed. And that was to get to a point where an individual, a woman, would not have to be subjected to that kind of decision. It, it allowed women to get contraceptives for nothing. Thank you. And that was my bill. I, too, would like to say Yes, that. go ahead, Ms. Yeah. Ms. Clay. Um, at this point in time, Vermont already has some of the most permissive abortion laws in the country, and I don't see that changing. It's been codified in law that abortion is protected in the state of Vermont up to the time of birth if a medical provider can be found that would perform such an abortion. So I don't see the ambiguous language in Article 22 being a good way to tinker with the Constitution. Thank you. Now we're moving on to a global question that affects Vermont a lot that has to do with climate change. The effects of climate change are already being, being felt across the world. Do you believe Vermont should take additional steps to limit carbon emissions in the state? We'll begin with Gina Galetti. Galfetti. Galfetti. <laughs> uh, so, um, I'll get it. <laughs> I certainly do believe that the uh, climate is changing. Um, we've had record flooding, heat waves, and a global drought. So, there's no denying that the climate is changing. However, um, I do think that there's a problem with climate change modeling. Um, despite extensive modeling, scientists still don't know the full extent of the impact of clouds, for example, on their climate models. And the computing power that's necessary to do, to conduct some of this research is not even available to program in all of the variables that are um, present in climate modeling. So I asked the question of what 
what is the impact that we're having. Um, my other thing is that I think that climate solutions, especially in the state of Vermont, need to be sustainable and attainable and have demonstrable results. Um, we need to develop a grid that can support um, an electric initiative. We don't have that right now. We've got um, a deficiency in the ability to use electric cars effectively. Um, I think that we need to keep investing in weatherization, small scale solar, and electric vehicles where it makes sense. Uh, and that's basically how I feel about climate change. Thank you. Elizabeth Ha. Yeah, so um, if there's no doubt that, there, that climate change is a real struggle, a real issue. Um, it is something that um, many folks that I've been listening to uh, as I go out knocking doors has affected even the reason why they're moving to Vermont. They're saying that the places that they had called home for however many years before um, were the reasons why, one of the main reasons why they relocated to Vermont. Um, I'm actually really concerned um, th that we don't have not just um, the infrastructure for things such as electric vehicles, but we don't have the infrastructure for the, the income of folks from out of state who are going to be moving to Vermont because climate change is not going away. Um, we, the legislature has done a lot over the last uh, decade in helping to mitigate this. Uh, we're not gonna solve it all on our own just from our policies in Vermont. However, we need to continue to strive to find solutions that will be accessible and affordable to Vermont and at the same time help mitigate climate change but also make it so that you know our cost of energy can be more affordable. Uh, when we talk about having um, finite resources such as oil and gas, and that's what we base our energy and our heating and how we um, uh, our transportation on, well, it's finite resource. So as it diminishes, it's going to cost more and more for us to access those. But if we have the willpower and, and the community will to be innovative and move forward in that, not only will it create more jobs for us, but it will also help us be able to kind of um, uh, have a better idea of what the actual costs um, are going to be on, on folks' uh, individual budgets. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now, often in the news, guns. Topper needs oh, it. Sorry, Topper. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I knew that. Uh, that's good. Um, climate change. Yes. Um, yes, I believe that climate change is here. There's no question about it, it's real. Um, but what I don't know is how much is caused by uh, human activity, uh, how much is the natural, uh, the Earth's natural evolution. So that, that's one thing I don't know. Um, I know that forests in Vermont um, absorb a lot of carbon. Um, I know that we're developing solar arrays on a very organized uh, way. That's very helpful. I know that we've got some wind power. Uh, that's very helpful. I know we're, we're supporting uh, electric vehicles. Uh, that'll be helpful. One of the things that I worry about with the electric vehicles is the batteries. What are we going to do when the batteries have to, when we have to get rid of the batteries? That's going to, I think that's going to turn into a, a problem. What I do know for sure is I will not support a carbon tax by any name. Um, I believe that the residents of Barrytown and Williamstown are paying too much money now in taxes and they don't need to have to pay uh, higher costs for their fuel, whether it's in their car or it's used to heat their home or cook their food. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And now moving on to guns. What are your thoughts on an assault weapons ban? And do you believe we should have AR-15s without regulation? And what about a ban on modification devices such as bump stocks that increase the capacity or firing speed of non-automatic weapons? A big issue here in Vermont. And 
Dr. McClellan, we're going to start with you. Okay. Um, can you just repeat that sure. question? Because <laughs> sure. Because it's three or four. What are, your thought, what are your thoughts about an assault weapons ban? And do you believe we should have AR-15s without regulation? And what about a ban on modification devices such as bump stocks that increase the capacity or firing speed of non-automatic non weapons? Um, are you talking about nationally or are you talking about in Vermont? In Vermont. In Vermont, okay. Um, in Vermont, um, I don't think that um, we have to do anything with the gun uh, control laws, laws in Vermont. Um, let's make sure we enforce what we have on the books first. Um, I think another thing that we could do uh, to help the situation is rather than talking about and doing de uh, defunding the police departments, maybe what we should be doing is providing more training and uh, getting the police departments um, up to a full capacity. That may help us with, in terms of the crimes that are being, uh, um, the crimes that are happening because of the use of guns. Um, you talked about the AR-15, a complete ban on them. Um, I don't know how I feel about that, to tell you the truth. Uh, I do a lot of hunting. Um, I don't think you have to have an AR-15 in the woods to hunt, but um, I don't think that we should be making laws that say to people who are 18 years old and can go in the service and use one of those guns that they can't own one. I think that if they're old enough to go in the service and defend the country, that they should be old enough to own one of them. They know how to use it, and, it, and it's not going to be a problem. The problem is not guns. It's the problem is the people that use those guns to commit crimes. Thank you. Well, this is about how on guns. Yeah, so this is... Um uh, definitely a topic I've thought about a lot. Um, you know, I, um, I happen to have some really personal connections um, when it comes to, uh, to assault rifles um, and assault weapons um, in terms of how they can in negatively impact one's family. Um, uh, I have a, a dear friend who was... Um, um, who actually became a, a paraplegic because of um, because of a, a gun a gunshot wound, and so uh, I have conflicting ideas because on the one hand I love going out and um, and uh, shooting targets. Um, I, I'm not big of a hunter. I don't like to kill animals if I don't have to. Um, but I also have a lot of friends who um, who enjoy hunting for sports, um, and, and and I want to be able to support them. But I really question whether assault weapons of any form have a place in our society. And if they do have a place, because I know that some folks like for them for collections and whatnot, um, you know, I would want to have thoughtful dialogue with my constituents about what can that place be where you can still have access, but we do it safely. You know, we, we've made decisions about um, access to different things in the past, such as uh, you know, cars, vehicles. There are certain laws and regulations that we have when it comes to vehicles, certain licenses and operations that you need to take place in order to operate them, but we still have that privilege. And I think that I would have, I take a similar stand when it comes to gun regulations. It's there, but we have to ha think about the safety of the community as well. Thank you. Gina Galfetti. Can you go ahead and just repeat that? Oh, one yes. One more time? <laughs> Thank you. Sure. What are your thoughts on assault weapons ban? Do you believe we should have AR-15s without regulation? And what about a ban on mo uh, the modification devices, such as bump stocks, that increase the firing speed of non-automatic weapons? Well, first off, I'd like to say there's a lot of misconceptions about the so-called assault rifle. Um, people consider a number of guns besides the AR-15 assault rifles when they're actually no different than a traditional hunting rifle other than the way they look. Another misconception is that AR stands for assault rifle 
when in actuality it stands for ArmorLite, the company that makes the AR-15. Uh, in, in I actually own an AR-15 and I own it for hunting purposes. And the reason I own it is because it's considerably lighter, the stock's adjustable um, for somebody that's my size. And I find it to be a very efficient um, method of hunting. As far as the bump stock question goes, I don't think that we need to control bump stocks and other um, things that s uh, simulate automatic fire because what we need to do is be educating people um, on the safe use of firearms in general. Uh, the Constitution, Second Amendment guarantees us the right to bear arms and it's the responsibility of every citizen to understand how guns are used and at the very least render them safe. Um, the purpose of the Second Amendment, it was not to guarantee hunting rights, but to allow people to protect themselves from both others and tyrannical governments. Thank you. Now we're moving on to something really important to all of us about Vermonters. The governor frequently says we need to attract new families and workers to Vermont while keeping our own young people at home. What can the legislator do to attract and keep workers in Vermont? We're gonna start with Melissa Bata. Um, <clears throat> so in order, I'm, I'm one of those folks that the governor talks about, right? I came to Vermont uh, for grad school and it reminded me of my hometown village in Florida and um, only with much nicer weather because uh, as much as Florida is great when it's you know middle of February and it's really cold here for a visit um, I, I really didn't like having the heat year-round I love the seasons here and and the community is just the type of community that I enjoy uh, but in order to be able to attract um, more folks like me who are have a young family or our young folks, we need to make sure that we have things like affordable housing. We need to have um, livable wages so that people can actually afford to live here. We need to have infrastructures like childcare. Our childcare system right now is really abysmal. And in Barrytown, it's really hard to find a childcare center on the bus route when you have school age kids that are not old enough to take care of themselves yet. Um, and that impacts uh, folks' ability to be able to work full time. Um, we also need to think about things such as, um, as uh, paid family medical leave. You know, you want to have, you want to attract folks to come to Vermont. If we had a paid family medical leave, that, that's something that folks think about when they're considering their careers and where they're actually going to locate for work. Um, broadband, I know that the, the legislature has been working on that, but we need to get that here if we want to be able to have folks that can work um, from home or, or in office spaces in more rural areas. Thank you. Next, Topper McFawn. Um, I think the legislature has to have a comprehensive economic development plan. Um, we really don't have that now. Um, I think we have to support uh, technical centers, career centers, job training programs, um, so that individuals who choose not to go to college um, can see a path forward to good paying jobs. For example, plumbers. If you hire a plumber, you're not much you're gonna pay them. Electricians, the same thing. Um, social media jobs. The other thing I think we need to do is provide incentives to existing businesses that are here so they can expand. We need to provide incentives to businesses that are planning to, that would like to come to Vermont. Um, another thing that we could do is take military pensions and exempt them from the, the uh, Vermont sales tax. That would allow people in, uh, in their 40s and 50s um, who are retiring from the service um, to come to Vermont. Uh, they're well trained. They would be good. They would be great as we rebuild the workforce. So there's some things that I think that we uh, we can do. Thank you so much. Yep. Jean Galfetti. So this is an issue that's very close to me. I own and operate a small painting company here in Vermont, and finding people that are ready to work 
is getting more difficult all the time. I often have people coming seeking jobs that have little to no experience. And if they're willing to work, I'm certainly willing to put, give them a shot at G-Force. Um, but I believe if we aggressively promote the trades in schools and stop selling the um, college dream theology for everybody, college isn't right for everyone. And encouraging kids to get into trades education and other kinds of vocational training, such as in the healthcare industry, will have um, kids that are going into higher paying jobs that will afford them the ability to stay in Vermont. Um, We've got a problem right now. The average age of a carpenter is about 55. And without new blood coming in there to fill those positions, we're not going to be able to sustain it. Uh, another option that I think would be excellent is for the state of Vermont to eliminate or reduce taxes, taxes on new businesses that are coming into the state. You know, if we could eliminate those taxes for a period of time and then gradually increase them, I think we'd promote a lot of economic development and interstate commerce. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to a, a subject that's near and dear to all Vermonters, which is education. Do we need to change the way we fund education? Less property tax, more income tax. Vermont is consistently ranked among states with the highest annual per pupil spending at more than $20,000 per student. Are we getting a good return on our investment? And we'll start with Topper McFawn. Um, I think that we could do uh, better in our, our education system. Uh, I know that uh, COVID-19 disrupted uh, our education system in a big way. It was very difficult for the teachers and the children going to school. Um, do I think we're getting the best return for our money? Um, I'm a product of the public education system. Uh, I did pretty well. So uh, I think the public education system, uh, for the most part, is, uh, is functioning fairly well. Could it do better? Yes. Um, one of the big things, and I talked about this earlier, was the, the, the technical centers and the career centers. Uh, I think we should uh, do more there so that if people don't want to go to college, um, they can get a good paying job. Uh, I also feel that the apprenticeship programs that we have in the career centers, uh, we should use them more, and um, that, will, that will produce a, a solid workforce. Um, in terms of um, changing how the education system is funded, I think it's time to broaden the base uh, of funding in our education system. Um, I look where would I get that money if I'm elected? Um, I would look at, um, for instance, the sales tax. Um, that way everybody pays, even people that come into the state uh, as tourists. Um, uh, probably the rooms and meals tax is a, is a place that uh, people might uh, be involved. Uh, I, th I think we probably are going to look have to look at the income tax. But the big thing is, Every one of these taxes that I've mentioned, you have to reduce the property tax. Thank you. Next on education is Gina Golfetti. All right, you got it. I got <laughs> it. <laughs> um, I think that uh, you know, COVID definitely had a negative impact on uh, education practices in the state of Vermont. Uh, we've got a 41% proficiency in math right now. So that means 59% of our students are not proficient in math. And that's troubling. Um, one of the things that I think is a problem is the consolidation of schools, in my opinion, was a big mistake. Um, school consolidation and the big box approach to education has negatively affected students. Um, returning to smaller localized schools, 
with the need for less administration would ensure that more money was available to retrofit schools and eliminate costly administration uh, positions. We're spending a lot of money on administration and not enough money on students. Um, when I was a kid walking to school uphill both ways, <laughs> schools were supported by their immediate communities and parents were more involved. Um, and I received an excellent education in the public school system. However, I do see that smaller private schools and um, people that are homeschooled are turning out students that are well prepared to advance in school or vocational or technical training. Um, so that's the reason I support school choice. And I think it's important to really look at the way our education dollars are being spent. Thank you. Finally on schools, Melissa Bata. Um, yeah, so, you know, it, it's interesting because schools, is, we just uh, had the question about how do we attract uh, other folks to Vermont. And schools is one of the main reasons why we chose to stay here and raise a family here. Um, you know, I, I did... Um, I was schooled in Florida. I went through public school. I was homeschooled for a couple of years, and I went to a, a private Christian school. And I have to say that out of all those school systems, um, for me, I feel like the, the public school education was the best education I received. Um, had more access to a variety of programs and enrichment activities that just the uh, homeschooling and smaller education in my situation didn't, didn't help. Um, so. I feel that the quality of education that we have in Vermont is actually really good. Um, it's why we chose to stay and, and have our kids go to public school here. Um, but tying how we pay for schools and um, how we have our budgets for schools, tying that to property taxes really um, is detrimental to certain folks, especially like folks who are on fixed incomes. Once you get the property reassessed, you know, you're thinking, my, my property tax is going to be this. Um, and then we have to change it. And so, um, you know, I would agree that we need to, to look at other ways of funding education um, and broadening that base of who's actually supporting our school systems. Thank you. Lots more to say on that topic, I can tell from all of you. <laughs> but I'm looking at the time and I'm realizing we're, we're, time, we're ready for closing statements. So we'll take a few, minute, few seconds, really, and ask you to give us about a minute and a half to sum up closing statements. And while, while they're doing that, I'm Linda Radke, and this is the Candidate Forum on ORCA, and also co-sponsored by The Bridge. And we're speaking to three candidates for state representative. That's um, Melissa Bata, Gina Goffetti, and Topper McFawn. Let's see. We could start with Gina. All right, so as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm a Barrie girl. I grew up in Barrie. I've built a life here. And I want to see the Barrytown way of life protected in the future. I'd like to see um, people getting involved, involved in the legislature, such as myself, who aren't aspiring to become career politicians and don't label themselves as, as such. We need to bring some balance back to the state of Vermont. Um, the supermajority in Montpelier is really forcing an agenda that isn't necessarily organic to Barry Town. And I look forward to having the opportunity to serve as Barry Town's next state legislator. And I would ask all of you out there to consider a vote for me. Please reach out to me via um, phone, email, Facebook, um, my phone number is 802-461-3520. And I'd like to, again, thank Orca Media and The Bridge for hosting this event tonight. Thank you. Melissa Bata, your closing statement. Yeah, so, um, you know, I just wanted to say that um, when it comes to being a state representative, I feel that uh, you need to represent the community. And the best way of representing the community is by listening to the community. Um, you know, my years of being a community organizer, 
gotten pretty good at listening. I enjoy having a cup of coffee. I enjoy uh, you know, coming into the kitchens of the, the folks that I've been knocking on doors on and chatting with them about you know, the struggles, the concerns, where, where you see the community going. And I can pledge as, as your next uh, state representative that I will continue listening. I will continue to um, reflect the views of the community in Montpelier and, um, and support our community to be the strongest that we can so that we can continue to grow and live and thrive in Berrytown and Williamstown. Um, I thank you very much for listening tonight and hope that you consider a vote for me um, on November 8th or before. And if you need more information, Melissa Bata for VT.com has um, my uh, contact information and I'd be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. And finally, Topper McFawn. Thank you. Um, in my opinion, uh, the legislature needs to be more moderate, it needs to be more balanced in its approach uh, to solving Vermont problems. I also have some unfinished business in the legislature. I've worked for about two years now with individuals with developmental disabilities. Um, those people have problems even getting out of bed. And I think it's about time that the state of Vermont takes a real close look at uh, what those people need in terms of services um, so that they can live a life, the best life that they can based on the disabilities th uh, that they have. I know that between the ages of 22 and 60, those people do not get the services that um, they, they, they need. I followed a family um, all the way through the process of trying to seek services for their children. Um, they don't have them yet. And uh, one of the, that's what I mean by unfinished business. I want to get in there and, and do that. I will listen to what people have to say. Um, I have done that all the time. I've tried to represent the people of Barrytown in, in a positive way. I will do that for the people in Williamstown. And my last statement is, it's an honor to serve the people of Barrytown. I look forward to serving the people of Williamstown. And I would appreciate your vote on November 8th or before that. Thank you. Thank you to all our candidates on the Candidate Forum. We heard from Gina Galfetti and Melissa Bataille, Bata and Topper McFawn, both all running for that representative thing. We, this is our last forum of the series, sponsored by Orca Media. You can find out more at orcamedia.net or the Montpelier Bridge. And by now, you should have received your ballot for the November 8th election in the mail. And if you haven't, contact your city or town clerk. Thank you for joining us. The next thing, the best thing you can do really is to protect the democratic process and to vote. And we encourage you to do so. I'm Linda Radke. Thank you.